recording. Cool. And um, uh, Daphne, if you notice, if anybody pops in, would you, would you admit them? I, I I mean, I've asked everybody to come in without going through the waiting room, so hopefully they won't. But but uh, and hopefully we won't get Zoom bombed. And if we do, we'll just we'll kick them out as quickly as we can if they're not if they don't belong. Okay. Wow. How do you guys like Zoom classes? I used to go to USC. I can't imagine what it would have been like to go to USC and go to a Zoom class. If you guys want to, if you want to say what you think about it, I won't listen. <laughs> I know what you think about Chris. He's great. I know. <laughs> uh, this, Zoom sucks. I have to say. <clears throat> so, everybody, this is this is John Cinnamons ASC. You don't have your ASC after your name, <clears throat> and um, this is everybody. This is a uh, and Johnny. I don't know if you know Linda. Linda's here with her, a couple of her students from her class. Hi, hey, John. I think we spoke <laughs> earlier. Um, oh, I don't know. Maybe about a year ago. I was trying to rope you into teaching at USC. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> We're still trying to rope you in, John. <laughs> you know, I just heard a great interview. The interview you did on KCRW was really good. I, uh, you know, thank you very much. It's amazing. They must have some kind of filter to take the nervousness out because I didn't, sound, <laughs> you didn't sound nervous at all. I didn't Whoa. sound nervous at all. No. Right? <laughs> now you've got a great voice, John. And by the way, Johnny is the um, he's the voice of the ASC for the awards every year. He's the he does the announcing and he's got the smooth, smooth announcer voice. So it's, it's, he's pretty oh, great. Oh, thank you. All right. So we should talk about, let's, let's talk about cinematography and photography <laughs> and art in general. Um, I yeah, had mentioned art in general is the topic. Yeah. But let's start with your, where, how you got here. How I got into cinematography. Certainly not, not how you got to this zoom call. We know how you, <laughs> yeah. How did you get into, how did you become a cinematographer, a world-class cinematographer? Well, here's what happened. I was very fortunate to have received a scholarship to Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee and for photography. And while I was there, I studied painting and photography. And I guess it was about my second year of school, a man named Carlton Moss, who is the reason why I'm here in, this city, in this business, with you guys. I'm, I'm so grateful to him because he used to come to Nashville and he used to teach this class called The Image of the Black Man in American Cinema. And the class would start off with Birth of a Nation and you know, guess who's coming to dinner and how black people were being represented in Hollywood. And he started a film class down there. We'd make Super 8 films. And it was in the same building that I had a dark room in, that we had a dark room. And I showed him my photographs one day and he said, you're a cinematographer. I had never heard that word before. I'm from Chicago. Nobody talked about cinematography. I just said, yeah, okay, cool, right? And the next thing I know, he's, sending me a subscription to American Cinematographer Magazine. He, there's a company called Dove Films. It's no longer exists. It was owned by a couple, Roz Bernstein and Cal Bernstein. And Roz and Cal were very socially conscious and politically aware. When Cesar Chavez and the farm workers went on strike, we could no longer have grapes on the set. Um, when they found out that styrofoam cups were environmentally hazardous, no more styrofoam. Well, these people, Carlton Moss was uh, blacklisted and these people hid Carlton in their attic until he could prepare his trial. So that's the kind of people they were. So those people sent me a 16 millimeter Airflex S 400 foot rolls of film, a tripod, all arrived in my little $50 a month apartment while I was in college. I didn't know how to even load a magazine. I had seen somebody load a magazine once, but I was very foggy on how they did it. And I, saw, I was there because of photography, so I knew about film, right? But I felt like the 400 foot roll was tight enough that even if you loaded it in the light, 
maybe the first few feet would be destroyed. <laughs> so my first roll of film, I actually fogged because I thought it was okay to load the film in just a dimly lit room, right? So Carlton nurtured me in my early filmmaking. And, oh, but I have to tell you something that really happened. Before he sent me that equipment and got me that subscription, he came to Nashville and made an industrial film with a crew. It's called Happy Teeth, Happy Smile, right? <laughs> it was for the medical school. And I helped on that project. And I tell you, something that most people on this Zoom won't get to experience was I put my eye to that eyepiece. And I, I've been in love with a, I've been in love with a frame for years, you know. I'm a frame is my heart, but I put my eye to that eyepiece, and I turned the camera on, and I saw that shutter move as I panned, and I was hooked. I knew that that was something I wanted to do, right? So Carlton continued to you know, nurture me through my mistakes. I eventually began to make documentaries with him in Nashville. <laughs> Some of the cinematography is horrible. Um, and, you know, that, he saw that I loved it and he helped me get a scholarship to USC Film School where you guys are. Robert Weiss, the film director, looked at my work. He looked at my still photographs and helped me present it to the university and they let me in school. And I went through the program there and I didn't feel like I knew anything. I didn't feel like I got it. And I don't know if I'll ever feel like I got it, but I really didn't feel like I got it. So I got a job at a rental house called F&B Seco. And I learned how to repair cameras and prep cameras to go out on jobs. And what I learned there was that nobody really had it. <laughs> I mean, That's right. everybody that showed up had <clears throat> questions and everybody that showed up, even if I admired their work and, you know, admired their technical abilities to articulate things, you would always see how inquisitive people were, how curious they were, how unsure they were about things. And the reason why I'm saying that is because in this creative endeavor that we're all involved in, we never really arrive, you know? We never really get there, you know? We're always in this continual state of becoming. And it just takes so long to realize that that's all a part of it. And prior to that, you can beat yourself up. You can feel good about yourself for a few minutes. But the bottom line is that we're on this journey and we become fluent technically, at least Chris and I did, and people who dealt with the three or four film cameras that were around. But now there's like this overabundance of cameras. I just got a new camera the other day, a, a Sony uh, 7AC, right? And it's just like my Sony 7R3. But <laughs> when I look at the menus, it's like a whole new world, you know? But the bottom line, it doesn't really matter because the thing that we want to be able to do is we want to be able to tell stories. We want to be able to crystallize ideas. So that can happen on a cell phone, you know what I mean? That can happen on a saxophone, right? It just depends on what it is we're dealing with, you know, and I'm rambling now, I guess. No, I it's good stuff. Answer. This is great. I mean, <laughs> and you're actually dead on the money. I mean, that's, that's really important to hear. Um, and it's, I love the idea that nobody knows what they're doing. I mean, that is so true. No. I, every project I feel like it's a new, a new thing. <clears throat> Johnny, but let's talk about, you know, your, you're shooting, when you started shooting, you did a lot of hip hop videos in the early days, right? That was your kind of, not, or was that well, your kind of, or not hip hop, but. Uh, well, yeah, I well, mean. Hip hop, but before that too, I mean. 
before I did uh, music videos, I was doing lots of commercials. And the first music video I ever did, <laughs> another cinematographer started it, but it was a Stevie Wonder video called Ribbons in the Sky, which a lot of people still play at all their weddings. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how much, oh yeah, they were there. At the, I just got back from a wedding. They played Stevie Wonder. It's like the wedding song or whatever. But that opened up a whole new experience for me as a cinematographer. And in those days, the marriage of music and cinematography hadn't crystallized into what it is today. The acts didn't really know what it was that we did. Not only that, but they didn't know what it took to do it. I um, did a bunch of Stevie Wonder videos and the Stevie Wonder video that I'm talking about, we had like a 7 a.m. call and Stevie shows up at one in the morning, you know? I'm talking about one in the morning, yeah. right? With the whole crew laying on the floor of the stage, wondering when he was gonna show up. Well. That became pretty much the norm for all the music videos I've ever done. And I've done, I don't know how many Snoop Dogg videos, Tupac, Ice Cube, um, Britney Spears, the Isley Brothers. I, I can't even remember all the people that I've shot, but I can remember at the time, I don't mean to sound egotistical when I say this, but a producer would say, do you have a demo reel and I'd say, well, not a current one, but if you turn on MTV for about 10 minutes, I'm sure you'll see at least four or five of my videos, you know, because um, I was making a lot of them at the time. And then what happened that was really cool was I was driving down Melrose one day. And <clears throat> you remember when they used to have those cell phones that looked like a brief, briefcase, Chris? Of course. Right, of course. Like that, right? Yeah. And my cell phone rings and I hear the soundtrack to my demo reel. <laughs> this cat comes on the phone with this really thick French accent. And it started a whole new career in music videos because I went to France and worked for a company called um, Sector A, which was the equivalent of death row in Paris, right? And they wanted me to come to Paris and remake all the videos that I'd ever made in LA for every thug that I ever made a video for, right? So I went there and redid Check Yourself and What's My Name and all those Rump Shaker. I didn't do Rump Shaker, but I did a bunch of them, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, the nice thing about doing music videos that was really cool was that only thing you had to do was grasp the concept of what the story was. Then I could experiment in any way I wanted to, because what I had to deliver was at least six seconds of a good shot, right. right? And then when I was working with Snoop Dogg and Death Row with those music videos that were like, you know, $100,000 to $300,000, I had every piece of equipment imaginable. I think the last Snoop Dogg video I did was called What's My Name? I had three helicopters for that video, right? I mean, it was just like, endless bread and equipment and steady cams and remember those little miniature helicopters before drones what uh flying cam yeah, yeah. you put 16 millimeter cameras on yeah. i'd have those just about on every video you know <laughs> it's like so i got to experiment with a lot of stuff i got to make mistakes nobody cared you know and it was just really fun to, to do those things and it was a good period of my life. And, you know, I take pictures. I'm sure Chris probably shared some of my photographs with you. Yeah, I shared links with everybody. Hopefully everybody looked at it. I didn't take hardly any pictures during that period because I was so absorbed in cinematography and the movie camera. It just became so important. Every part of it, just the sound of a camera running. In fact, I missed that, don't you? I missed... I miss that <clears throat> of, I don't miss film, celluloid, I love it, but I really don't, I was saying to someone last night that was over here at my house, COVID safe, um, that, you know, I felt a little guilty when he asked me, did I miss 
miss film. And I don't, yeah. I don't miss it, you know, because I think that's what's most important is telling the story, you know, and capturing it. I, nothing fascinates me more then somebody says, look at this. And I look at something and get lost in it's iPhone, you know, and it's beautifully photographed and the narrative is clear. You know, it's, it almost doesn't matter what the technology is, you know, it's what we have to say. But with the sound of a movie camera, you knew you were rolling. With a video camera, sometimes I wonder like, did I just roll on that? Like, I, I don't remember. You know, I mean, what I don't like is these TV shows that I do, nobody calls cut. The director might say, hey, hold on a minute. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Makeup will say, can I get in there for a second? And then not only, I can't be, I, I can't talk about that. I say, you know, I need to make a little adjustment too. Camera's still rolling. Nobody's called cut, mm -hmm. right? And then somebody says, do we need to mark it? And then you hear some the AD say, no, we never cut, right? <laughs> and the thing, when I was at USC, uh, what was really cool about that, was it called a, a one, a 290, the very- Yeah, the, your first the, semester? The, the really, the first three minute thing you yeah. do. Yep, yeah, it was. Yeah. Teaches you how to economize film yeah. and time. Right. That is so important. It makes you plan. It makes you pre -vis what it is you want to do because you don't have that much footage. And not only that, you don't have that much time, right? To do this thing, you know, shoot it, cut it, process it, you know. And I think my whole life in capturing images has been affected by that because even as a still photographer, you know, I grew up with 36 exposures. So when you take a picture, it was actually a decision because, you know, you might have one more roll of film in your pocket. When I shoot film, I mean, when I'm shooting motion pictures, I'm still affected by that. You know, I'm still affected and influenced by it economizing the material. Editors appreciate that. Well, you know, it's funny. I remember on my, on my first film, the uh, producer asked me to give them a uh, film budget. Like, what? how much film did I need? Right. <laughs> Nobody ever told me that was part of the job. I didn't know that from school. It was, we never had any film. We could, whatever we could afford, a couple roles, it didn't matter. <clears throat> and I had to figure out, I had to go through the script and figure out how much of each emulsion I was gonna shoot on every scene <clears throat> and come up with a number. Exactly. And um, I still do that, even though I'm shooting digitally now. I still, oh. an exercise, <clears throat> because it is, it, it says, this is what I think this scene is going to be. And, and I've gotten really good at being pretty close. I, I was wondering about that um, when I was talking to somebody the other day. Because when I used to do those movies made for TV, like for Disney and Showtime and those people, you'd have 5,000 feet a day. That was understood, you know, 5,000 feet a day. Now you could distribute that 5,000 feet any way you <laughs> wanted to in, throughout any given scene. But I can remember sitting up right. in hotel rooms and, you know, having a bit of anxiety because I realized, well, I got to shoot half of this scene at high speed, mm -hmm. you know, at like 60 frames. So what does that do to my, the rest of my film budget? And mm -hmm. I can remember the first movie that I ever shot as a DP, Tim Reed directed it. It was called Once Upon a Time When We Were Colored. And I can remember that the last shot in that movie, when you see this truck drive off in the rain, is my last bit of film. <laughs> when that truck left the frame, there was nothing else to shoot. That, it was a wrap. Right? <laughs> it was, there wasn't one more foot of film in North Carolina that belonged to John Simmons. <laughs> That's awesome. <clears throat> we, were doing a, we were doing a movie where um, the pr production manager, I guess, pulled me aside and said we were shooting too much film. 
but it was right after a meeting we had had with the producers who said they loved everything we were doing, keep doing it. And so I said to him, I said, you know, the producers told us we were doing great. And he said, well, you're shooting too much. And I said, well, I roll when the director says action roll. And I, I cut when he says cut. So which, which takes should I not roll on? Because I don't have any, I'm not rolling for myself. He was so mad, but you know. That's funny. Yeah. I, it reminds me of another story. I was doing this TV show for Disney called Pair of Kings. It was fun. It was like making a movie every week, right? And it was a big stage over at Sunset Gower Studios. And it was a jungle. So I had lights, uh, what do they call it? Not, not space lights, but. Uh, like chicken coops or? Not chicken coops, are the, the space, uh, lights. space lights. Space lights, I had space lights all around. And the producer comes downstairs and he says, Johnny, you got to get rid of some of these lights. I was like, okay, let's start turning them off. I said, I can get rid of those over there if you want me to. Talk to the dimmer board operator, kill that. Hmm. I said, looks like the jungle disappeared back there. You got any, I don't know what to turn off. You got any ideas? And he just looked at me and walked away. <laughs> But what I was thinking about when you were talking about film is that one thing that has happened, and I was thinking about this in regards to that first feature film, is I can remember going to Keslo camera and having to shoot my filter test out of the loading dock door. Yep. Because I didn't have insurance to take the camera away. Mm -hmm. I couldn't employ people to help me. I just had to go and see what an 85 EF looked like, 81 EF, how it's gonna affect the color temperature and the tobacco filter and all these different things that I could make decisions with. And those decisions wound up in the movie. Now, with digital technology, I can take my Sony camera, which pretty much works in the same color space as the Venice or the uh, yeah. F55. Those are the two cameras I seem to get stuck with all the time. And I can shoot tests. I can just walk out in front of my house and shoot a test now. Mm -hmm. You know, you can storyboard visually with an iPhone. I have my sun scout that tells me the best time of the day to face in this direction or the other direction. But the thing that doesn't change, the storytelling doesn't change. The interpretation of a narrative, whether it's for 30 seconds, whether it's for an hour, the way as filmmakers we interpret a visual, that doesn't change. I was very grateful when I was at USC, I was painting houses and working. I had a lot of jobs, I had a kid. So, you know, it wasn't like I wasn't able to chill. Um, but one of my gigs was I worked at a place called Wexler Films, mm -hmm. which is one story. But I also worked as a house painter and I would paint houses. And my mentor, the guy I was telling you about, Carlton Moss, says to me, I have a house for you to paint. And he gives me the address. I have a Volkswagen station wagon. I've got a couple of buckets, some paint rollers, a couple of brushes, whatever could fill up a Volkswagen, some drop cloths. And I follow this address and I find myself in Beverly Hills and the houses are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <clears throat> and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what I could really paint in this neighborhood unless it's a doorknob or maybe a door, but I knock on this door and a woman dressed as a maid answers the door. And she says, Mr. Heisler is waiting for you. He's in the garage. His name was Stu Heisler. He was a director. He was Mary Pickford's editor and he was Howard Hughes's editor. And his film career begins in the silent era. 
I walk into the garage and it's a huge garage, like four cars. And there's a stairway that goes up and a platform that you walk along that's at a different elevation than the cars. And I say, Mr. Heisler, he says, oh, Johnny? I said, yeah. He says, come over here, I'm back here. And he was this real crotchety old guy sitting in a big cushioned chair. It's eight o'clock in the morning. And he says to me, you want some Jack Daniels? I said, Jack Daniels? I said, no, I don't want Jack Daniels. He <laughs> said, you got something against Jack Daniels? I said, no, no, Jack Daniels is okay. I'm just ready to paint this house or money, <laughs> Jack Daniels. He said, before we get started, I need to know something. Are you a cameraman? or a cinematographer. I said, I'd like to think of myself as a cinematographer. He says, great, because any idiot could be a cameraman. <laughs> he, says, he says, grab that book over there. And I grabbed a book and it's Aristotle's Poetics. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, the structure of drama. I spent weeks and weeks with this man. And I would put on my paint clothes thinking that maybe today we're going to paint. And I'd get out his, get to his house and he would talk about the poetics. And he would talk about that as a cinematographer, if I want to know when to do a close-up, how close to make a close-up, how far and how fast to move the camera. He said, you need to have this inside of you. You need to understand this. As an editor, I knew it. And as a director, I knew it. And I'm gonna tell you something. I learned it at, I had already had that class at UCLA, I mean at USC when I got to Stu's house. But this cat really broke it down to me. And he would bring scripts out and tell me who the protagonist was, the antagonist, what they did, what they wanted, you know, when they wanted it, and why they wanted it. And I tell you, as a cinematographer, that thing has helped me incredibly well. I mean, it has like really helped me as a cinematographer and a storyteller. And I don't know if I told you this, Chris, but this year, I directed an episode of the TV series that I'm shooting. And it was interesting because I didn't ask to direct it, but the showrunner asked me that I want to direct it, direct one. I said, yeah. She said, okay, next season you can do it. So one of our cinematographers in the ASC named Gary McLeod had told me about him taking acting classes. Mm -hmm. And another cinematographer named Stephen Fearberg also mentioned that. So I went out to the Beverly Hills Playhouse and took a series of acting classes. I can't tell you guys. I mean, I already did my episode and that really helped. But what I saw in that experience was I wish I had taken acting classes too. So the only thing I'm saying is while you cats are young, it might be nice to take a class or two because there's something really valuable in there for you. you know? Johnny, when I was a student uh, at a school not to be named across town, uh, I took an acting for directors class, which was, um, I was terrible. But, but yeah, I learned a lot. And I felt like, well, just what you're saying, as a cinematographer, <clears throat> I felt like I needed to know what actors expected. I needed to know yeah. what directors expected. Um, and that was the time to do it. And they had the classes, so, yeah. Yeah, you know, we're all very fortunate because the magic of being filmmakers and the magic of learning the things that we're learning, everything that we study and we learn become applicable to life. You know, I mean, they, they just, the whole experience begins not just to shape our ability as filmmakers, but it shapes our ability to just deal with life in general. Yeah. And 
I'm 70 years old now. I wasted a lot of time not knowing that. And I don't know how I could have known it any sooner, but I see that it has helped a lot. And not only that, but everything we learn becomes a reference for the work that we do. I, I've always been involved in painting and those kinds of visual arts. <clears throat> and I was very fortunate to <clears throat> help this man. His name's Aaron Douglas. I don't know if anyone on this Zoom call has ever heard of the Harlem Renaissance, mm -hmm. but it's a famous historical period in African-American art. And Aaron Douglas is called the father of the Harlem Renaissance. And I was very lucky and fortunate to help him repaint a mural. And he talked about, um, you know, design and proportion, the golden ratio and symbolism and abstract interpretations and things like that. And as a cinematographer, I studied lots of paintings and it, it really helps to spend time in some art books and to go to museums because we're dealing with an art form that the machine itself is a very mature instrument. It has the ability to give us perspective. It has the ability to give us positive and negative space. <clears throat> and on top of that, it has the ability to affect lives and change minds. Just looking through that, that thing um, is, is just so magical. And we have to be able to take advantage of everything that feeds that. And I used to go to the museums to uh, look at stuff before I would shoot. And eventually I did a class for years, I did a class where we would make a kitchen look like a Caravaggio and change it into a Vermeer and change it into a hopper and we would duplicate paintings and stuff like that. And then one day I was over at the LA County Art Museum and I was looking at some painting from like the 16th century. And I realized that there were no art stores. There was nowhere to go buy a paintbrush. There was no place to buy paint. There was no place to buy canvas. Everything was manufactured. You'd look at your dog and say, hmm, that looks like some good stuff for a paintbrush. Your partner would be sleeping in the bed. You'd say, yeah, I guess they won't wake up. Take a little bit of that hair, make another paintbrush, you know? And then you would go to the place where they, so where they made sales for ships, get you some canvas, somebody kill a rabbit, say, hey, let me have that skin. And you'd make some rabbit skin glue to stretch on the canvas. All while you were contemplating what was going to go on that canvas and what story you had to tell. By the time you were able to collect all the elements to make this picture and touch that brush to canvas, that image would have not only what we see and appreciate at the museum, but it would have a subtext. It would have a life beyond the frame. And everything there in that frame was intentional. There were no accidents, except the accidents that you lived with after you made them. And us as filmmakers almost have to approach things that way in the days when we had to economize on film time and the lack of equipment, we were very careful at what we would nurture. Now things happen with a little more expedience because it's so immediate. And not only that, but 
it is confirmed by a monitor as a serious confirmation factor that's telling us the truth, right? So a lot of our decisions get made in that arena. But I think that it's very important to spend time in those art books and spend time in those museums and, you know, Visions of the Light, that movie, the original one, yep. is incredible. You could eat that. And Jack Cardiff, cameraman, yep. tells you watch that film and you know that there's no such thing as the word can't, right? And I feel like all those things together are like eating a meal. You know, you just keep feeding yourself with that stuff. Please. And then suddenly it just becomes your DNA, you know? Right, let's transition for a second. Okay, because I'm blabbing. I could go when, I go, when I go to a gallery these days, it's good to see your photographs. <laughs> so I want to talk about your stills. And then we'll we can talk, if there's time, we can talk about your collages. But I know that your first gallery show was what, like three, four years ago? Was that that recent? Well, the when first show I ever had on 6th Street, right? Was in Nashville, Tennessee oh, okay. in the 70s. <clears throat> and then what happened was a very good friend of mine who was a writer, um, he uh, died of cancer. And I was with him in those last days. And he was probably about 10 years older than me and very influential in me becoming who I am. Um, and he was a writer and he never got his stuff published. And he was always reading something that was <clears throat> super hip and valuable. And he died. And I realized nobody was ever going to see anything that he ever wrote. And I had a studio in East Los Angeles. And I walked in there one day and I was looking at a picture I took of the Black Panthers. And I've been with my wife for over 30 years. And before her, I was with another woman who's a very good friend of mine and I love her for 10 years. And I realized that neither of those women had ever seen any of my pictures. So I began to print these pictures. And I said, well, if I die, I won't wind up like Vivian Meyer. You guys know who she is? Yeah, I said, at least I won't be her, right? I'll have a big box of prints and it'll be over here in the room. And if I fall on the ground, they can pick up the box and have some pictures. So I was at the ASC one day and my friend, Charlie Lieberman, cinematographer, ASC member, saw my pictures and introduced me to a gallery. And I tell you, as artists, it's amazing how unsure we are. I don't know if you guys are, but I'm always unsure about the things I do in terms of creativity. And the guy at the gallery gave me an exhibit and it was, the building would only hold like 60 pictures. So I called the exhibit, it started in the 60s and it was really successful. In the first couple of months, close to 2000 people saw the exhibit. I sold a bunch of pictures. And now these photographs have taken on a life of their own. They're, um, well, like I did that interview on the radio today, I'm gonna be in the Getty as soon as the Getty opens back up. And they just became important, you know, and that wasn't their intention to be where they are now, but it, it seems like, you know, they, they're doing something. But you've had a lot. Of, I mean, look, you've had several shows since that first show you've had. Oh, in, yeah, in I've, had, I've had like shows in New York. And, you know, People are collecting your pictures. Some of them are in museums yeah. now. I had a, I was part of a show at Harvard University's Art Museum not long ago. Yeah, they're um, they're taking off. Yeah. And those pictures, all my negatives were in a fire. And they got disorganized. Nothing matched proof sheets anymore, right? So every now and then I discover a new picture, you know, as I'm going through these negatives and it's working, you know, it's, it's, it's turning out to be something, something important. You know, it speaks of a time that no longer exists. And I still take pictures. I carry a camera every day. You know? I was going to say that you're still taking pictures and you can see when you see your new work, 
you can see a direct DNA to your early work. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm just beginning to see that. I've heard a lot of people say that, <clears throat> but yeah, I'm uh, I'm all about you know telling a story with that camera. The thing about it is making TV and movies is a collaboration. You know, I had to talk about Miami's the other day on something. And I thought about how, how unfair an Emmy is, you know, or an Oscar. Because the only reason I have any of those things is because of the collaboration of everybody that was telling the story, you know? I mean, I can't do anything without the PA picking up paper cups. I can't do anything without the art director giving me some good windows, you know, and the prop person giving me the right stuff to look at. So by the time you walk up on that stage to receive an award, it's just, it's just not fair because everybody should be there. <clears throat> but on the, on the other hand, you want to tell the story about your set recently that didn't work so well for you? But wait a minute, I got to oh. say this, that when I go out there with my still camera, nobody's there to tell me nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, I get to make all decisions. Nobody's saying speed up, hurry up, you know, you know, and then that damn monitor, we didn't have those back in the day. That damn monitor, you got some producer saying, can you brighten that up a little bit? And I said, well, where are you watching? I'm watching on my laptop. <laughs> well, lean it forward a little bit. See, that's a little better than before. I had one of those with Tom Warner at CBS recently. I don't remember what was I telling you about the set. That was set? <clears throat> Tell me about a pilot you did, and there was a there was a set, and the, you couldn't work on it. It was, and then the the uh, I don't want to give too much away in case you don't want to share the story, but uh, you had a little back and forth with the uh, production designer. Said that another friend of ours had no problem with his work. Oh, I'm dealing with that right now. Oh, that's this show now. Oh, I thought that was. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay. No, that's like this <clears throat> morning. I went to Paramount. I'm dealing with that today. Talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind. Well, you know, like as a, you know, we're in the business of saying yes. We're not in the business of saying no. And that old guy, Stu, Stu Heisler, that I was telling you about, that told me about the poetics. Yeah. He got called out of retirement to make a film. Um, and it was like some, you know, little dramatic thing, you know, that Encyclopedia Britannica used to make these short dramas, right? And they brought Stu in. And I was sitting at his feet, you know, listening to him every move, right? And the cinematographer was a guy named Michael Henderson that lived in my neighborhood and would take me to work with him. And I learned a lot from him. He was a good cat. And I even rented an apartment from him. <laughs> and, and this guy is about to shoot something for Stu. And he says to Stu, I can't do that. And Stu didn't say anything. He just walked over to the producers and he said, how long will it take you to get another cinematographer in here? And the producers are like shocked. I'm shocked because <laughs> Michael's so nice. And the producer says, what are you talking about? He says, I've never worked with a cinematographer that used the word can't and I won't work with this guy, right? So for the next few minutes, Michael was trying to clean up what he really meant to say wasn't can't, you know, and all that. So. That's the business that we're in. Can't doesn't exist. We're all there to say yes. So this art director that I'm working with, who I've done shows with in the past, who's just been amazing. I go into the set the other day and I looked, he doesn't work on a computer. A lot of these art directors work on a computer so you can see the camera angles and you can see the point of view. You can see what the elevations really mean. You know what I mean? And this guy just draws stuff. So I go into the studio and these walls are 16 feet tall. And I look at the drawing and he has a man standing in a doorway in a kitchen. The ceiling in the kitchen is 13 feet high. There's nowhere for me to put lights. I said, my man, look at the guy standing in the doorway. I said, the widest shot we ever get in this stage will be about three feet above this guy's head. 
I said, Johnny, Bye. Johnny, I'm going to, I'm going to, hey, Johnny, I'm going to interrupt for one second. Just for, tell everybody, this is a multicam, correct, Johnny? Yeah, this is a multicam, but you know, multicam. Multi so, yeah, so Johnny, just to give context, <clears throat> this is a multicam where he's got four cameras going and you guys have all seen those shows. You know how wide they're going to get. Okay. I just want I wanted to give everybody some context. For yeah. That. And you know, multicams have changed a lot. You know, they like to feel like single camera shows now. People are more willing to accept shadows and texture than they ever were before. And I say to the cat, I said, man, we're never going to see any of that. He says, yeah, but I need to give the producers eye candy when they walk into the stage. I said, that's ridiculous. So just as fate would have it, the producer shows up in the middle of the conversation. So now the walls are cut down to 14 feet, but they should actually be 12 feet, but I'll take 14 feet. And then my conversation with him the other day was he puts, you know, on these stages, we have a four foot lane that's called the fire aisle and nothing can be in the fire aisle. And so usually what you wanna do is you wanna back that set off the fire aisle so that you're not, if you have equipment, you can set it someplace and not block the safety passage. I go there in the other day and I say, why is that door, is that the doorway to this woman's apartment? I said, why is it on the fire lane? And the construction guy says, that's where it is on the plot. So I call the art director up. I said, hey, man, if the lady comes in her apartment with two bags of groceries, she's not going to be able to make the corner and get into the thing without bumping against the firewall. He said, what are you talking about? I said, OK, look at it like this. When she's in the apartment and the other person comes to the door and we do the over the shoulder to see into the apartment, where's the camera gonna go? And he says, oh my God. He says, can we use blue screen? I said, blue screen, that's not gonna make space, right? So I went there today, this morning and they're still building that wall. <laughs> I told him, I said, some director is gonna have a fit, man. No, I'm gonna correct it, I'm gonna correct it. But since I put it on the plot, I need to show it. So a lot of that is just to show people. I don't know what's going to happen. We're on a limited amount yeah. of time. There's so never if, he gets, time. if he gets an Emmy, he's going to owe it to you, Johnny. <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my drama today. I'm going to finish with you guys. I'm going to go over there and see where it landed. Because, you know, you also try not to throw anybody under the bus because you want to be able to work with them and, you know, make a good show. It's, it's a lot different than independent productions, you know, right. which I miss so much because you're able to make decisions on the spot. And, you know, you shoot this because it's more fun. You shoot it because it's more beautiful. You shoot it because, hey, this is a better idea. Yeah. Whatever you do in TV always has to be discussed. It always has to go up the ladder and to people that are afraid to say yes or no, you know? It's a different kind of relationship. That's the other thing that you guys have to learn is the first thing that we learn is we get past all this technical stuff where we can become just a little more comfortable with cameras and lights and things that cameras do. And then we have to learn how to negotiate the environment which starts with negotiating the environment of our crew. And then that transforms into dealing with studio personalities and executives and things. Politics. This isn't to put anyone down, but I've worked with some very talented crew members that could actually be cinematographers or directors, but they lack that skill. They lack the skill of being able to negotiate and talk. I mean, we have to go in there and babysit people that never heard the word no before or haven't heard it in a long time. So some way as a cinematographer, you have to make them think that that was their idea. 
you know, <laughs> you, you know what I mean, Chris? <laughs> no, I know, you know, it's funny when, I don't remember the last time I said no to somebody, but <clears throat> what I always say is, yeah, we can do that. And it's gonna take, you know, an hour. On the other hand, we could do this and it will take 10 minutes. So it really depends on, you know, we can do either. And I'm yeah. the only, <clears throat> even you were telling one story, John, you reminded me, I don't know if I've told this story already in the class, but I'll share it anyway quickly. I was doing a movie, we were doing some day for night on the beach and the production manager decided we could get rid of my lights because um, we're shooting day exteriors on the beach. <clears throat> so the executive producer happened to be there and I said, come on over. I said, would you like to look through the camera? And he said, yeah, thanks. So he looks through the camera. He says, I can't see anything. I said, I know, just give your eye a second. And his eye adjusts and he goes, oh my God, it looks like night. I said, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? And then I had one of the electricians pan my 12K off and he goes, what just happened? I don't see anything. I said, yeah, your, your production manager just took away my lights. <laughs> and uh, I got to keep them. So you got you to know who you're talking to. You got to talk to the right nice. people. Find a way to show it. Yeah. Johnny, you know, the politics is so important. And what you touched on is, you know, how do you navigate? It's a world full of egos where a cinematographer really can't have an ego. <clears throat> um, but, but the thing that I really want to focus on is, is that the politics and how you navigate it. And also I want to talk a little bit about the inclusive hiring. I, everybody was, has hopefully has read your article at least twice. They've all received it twice. And uh, I think that's so important. You know, how do we relate to one another? How do I'll, we tell, you, environment? I'll, I'll tell you that in a second, but this is funny. Okay. <laughs> there, there was a producer who's actually my best friend now, right? He's one of my best friends. And he took me out of music videos and into commercials. And I was really glad to get out of music videos because not only was it hard to make a music video, it was just as hard to get your check, you know? So that was a problem. So this guy, oh my God, he was like a spoiled child on the set. He could make life so miserable to crew people. But then there was the other side of him that I really enjoyed. I was talking to my wife one day. She says, you know what you have to do? You have to treat people the age they're acting. And you have to be a parent that can't discipline that child, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, right? So all of a sudden I would work at this guy and I'd say, okay, <clears throat> so the adult has left and now I'm dealing with the 12 year old, right? And it definitely, helped me get past that guy. And we've made lots of things together. But that's always been funny to me is treat people like the age they're acting. <laughs> I don't know if that makes take sense. Take away their ice cream. Yeah, take away their ice cream or give them ice cream, whatever. Ice cream. Now, when I came into the business, I was very, I grew up in Chicago taking photographs for a black newspaper. I go to college at a black university. Everything is familiar and comfortable. I wind up at UCLA, I mean USC. There are no other black people at school. There aren't even any, I don't think there, yeah, there's one Chinese kid in the class with me. So I felt like I had landed on, on the cultural moon, you know, and it was, it was cool, it was okay. But then I entered an environment in terms of employment where I never saw anybody like me. And I never saw any women, forget about that, you know? Nobody was speaking any, we had any accents unless it was from Europe. And it wasn't that inviting. One of my first jobs I ever had was working as a PA for Cal and Roz Bernstein, the people I told you about, mm -hmm. who were very politically conscious, socially aware. And it was my first day working after being a film student. And I go onto the truck and on the truck are the most derogatory and racist cartoons on the grip box you could imagine, it was horrible. So I went back in the building and I called my friend Carlton Moss who got me the job. And I said, hey Carlton, there's been a mistake. 
and I tell him what I saw. And he says, do you want to be a cinematographer? I said, yeah. He said, do you know any black folks or Mexicans or anybody like that making movies right now? I said, no. Boom. And he hung up the telephone. Whatever obstacles face you in your career, your passion has to be greater than those obstacles. No matter what color you are, no matter who you are, you're going to run into stuff that's going to make you want to say no. And you have to remember whatever it was that gave you the energy to want to go to film school, whatever gave you the energy that made you want to make a picture came from deep inside of you. It didn't have anything to do with anything. It felt like you had a place. And you always have to use that as what motivates you. And any problem you ever confront, your passion has to always be greater than that problem. And I would go to work. I work with these guys for about two years, this crew, as a PA. Go get me this coffee. Go get me that. Hey, Johnny, I got to tell this joke. It ain't got nothing to do with you, but it is about some, some colored folks. Just give me a minute, you know. And I have to sit there and listen to this shit. And there was this one guy, his name was Jerry Posner. He eventually became the owner of a company called Hollywood Rentals. And Jerry Posner, Jewish dude, would sit on the other side of the truck and just stare at me and stare at them and never say anything. And then when I got, every day when I was with those people, I learned two things. The cinematographer that I was working with was mean. And he wasn't just mean to me. He had just a mean streak. And I knew two things that I could do. I want to be a cinematographer that was a pleasure to work with because I loved what I was doing, right? And I wanted my crew to look like the world I live in. I wanted everybody. I wanted, I wanted the door of the set to open up. And if a kid 12 years old peeped through the door, no matter who they were, they could see a dream in there. That's always been like real high on my list. So I'm doing a show over at Warner Brothers. And, you know, they put your name on the wall. So it said, you know, director of photography, John Simmons. And I get there at seven o'clock one morning and there's a dude standing in my parking space. This is 20 years after that experience at Dove. And it's Jerry Posner. And he says, you know, I saw your name and I just stood here to wait for you, hoping you'd show up. But I just wanted to say, I knew you'd be okay because you didn't let those guys turn you away even if you had a question to ask and they said, wait a minute, in the most rudest way they could possibly say it, you just waited and then asked the question later. When they didn't want to answer it, you asked the question later, right? And now it's very important for me to be able to make sure that crews are they reflect who we are. And I've been a mentor to lots of people. And one of the things that I give them is I give them that, that they have to take that with them. Because the more inclusive we are, the better we are. Not just as filmmakers and storytellers, but the world becomes a better place. And we have to really be able to commit ourselves to that. And you don't see that often. I mean, it's, a, it's an added energy. It's another job on top of a job. And I see that not many people do it. As I walk around the stages of Paramount, I see that, you know, it hasn't happened in a lot of places, but I see that it has. There's that show called The Talk that Sarah Gilbert is the producer on. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was over at CBS one day. I saw that thing let out for lunch. Man, everybody was there. It looked like you got off the subway in New York City. 
Nice. Right? <clears throat> and that's what it should look like. You know, Johnny, there was just a film shooting on the next block for me a couple weeks ago. I'm not sure. <clears throat> I know that um, David O. Russell had been scouting there with Chivo, but I don't know if that's the movie they were shooting or not. <clears throat> uh, but the crew was, it was that. It was the UN of crew. It's one of the most diverse crews I've seen uh, around here in a long, long time. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. I mean, <clears throat> but here's what I was thinking the other day when I was feeling like a lot of my message gets lost is that a lot of times we're so, we get the job. And as creative people, we approach, approach it creatively. Then we get bombarded by the system that makes the job happen. And that <clears throat> navigation becomes your second job mm -hmm. while you got this job, right? So in order for you to really press inclusivity, it has to come from someplace deep in your heart. It has to be really important for you to really want to make the change because now what you're taking on is you're taking on the third job, right? right? And a lot of people aren't willing to do that. You know, they've already got their hands full with two jobs. And, you know, I, I, it's important to me. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. And I tell my gaffer and my key grip to hire this guy or that guy. And they said, well, Johnny, the last time we hired him, they were next to useless. They, they haven't done very much. I said, well, you know, we have to pretend like a dude just fell off the ladder. And we got to work until somebody shows up. So I want you to hire that guy that doesn't know very much or that woman that doesn't know very much. With that older person. I said, because that's what you have to do when you work with me. Because how many times have we gone out to work with three people and we should have had six? Right. Just pretend we're doing that for the day. You know, and one of those people is my key grip now. Right. Who came to work with me. 20 years ago and didn't know how to hold a bounce board right. or didn't know what a nail on plate was. But now he doesn't have to hold a bounce board or nail on a plate. He's <laughs> now he's the boss. <laughs> 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 and knowing that, he's not even working with me on the show I'm doing now. He's gone to do a better show. <laughs> and I'm glad because that's why we do it. You know, we do it so we can like, how many shoulders do I stand on? I stand on so many shoulders. I can't take credit for nothing except being grateful. You know what I mean? You know, you can take, I'll give you credit for one thing, Johnny. What is that? <clears throat> whenever Shut I up. call you, whenever I call you and my life is falling apart and I'm on a movie, you always tell me, you know, that there's 300 people who want my job and they'll be happy to take it. <laughs> and I'm living the dream. And I thank you for that. Cause I, that's why I call you. You always tell me that and it keeps me going when I'm running, when I'm fed up with the producers and the directors and the actors and I want to come home. Yeah, it's true. You always, you always give me just to tell me exactly what yeah. I need. I, you know, we work with some very difficult people in this business. And I was with my key grip and gaffer on a pilot we were doing not long ago. And I said, you know what we have to feel like? We have to feel like it's our first day of work. Mm -hmm. We have to feel like we never had an opportunity before and we're finally getting it. I said, we can't forget that. We have to go to work. Like it's the first day, as much as we can go to work. It's, well, I do that now. I go to work, man. I just, like I told you, I just left Paramount. I look at these windows that are on the set and I've already made decisions. Tomorrow, the equipment truck is gonna arrive and the big lights are all gonna be stacked up in the cave, all in the corner of the room. And everybody is believing that I'm doing the right thing. I'm probably the only one in the room feeling like. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 you know what? The good part about that is that I'm going to tell you guys right now, you're never going to know. Because the day you know, you don't need to do it anymore. I remember I was doing, in one of those ASC meetings. What's that director's name? I, I worked for him one day. That made Bad Boys and all that stuff. 
Uh, oh, John Badham. No, that's not who I mean. You think about Caleb? Caleb didn't do those movies, but he's no, no, no. I was thinking it was. Um, I can't remember some big time superstar cinematographer, and he was in there complaining, and he was complaining about only having ninety days prep, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the first day was going to have twelve cameras, right? And the director never can make up his mind, right? <laughs> and I'm like, ninety days prep? How about two days prep, right? <laughs> and a director that doesn't make up his mind. And you're begging for two cameras, right? <laughs> it's like it never changes. It doesn't. It doesn't make any difference whether you're making the biggest movie ever made or the smallest movie. All the problems stay the same. Everything, everything stays the same. Yep. Oh my God, that's so true. Yeah. <clears throat> but dig this, you guys. I think it's really. I don't want you to overlook that thing I was sharing with you about going to the museums and stuff. That's really helpful. And that poetics is helpful. You know, that's- during, during the pandemic, you can do the museums online. A lot of museums have- Yeah, you can see my exhibit online during the pandemic. So what is your URL, Johnny, where the exhibit is? At the Getty, that one or? No, 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 that one. Well, there is something online for the Getty, but I don't- Tell, tell me the URL for your current exhibit. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, there's a good article that, well, people say it's a good article about, uh, article about my work that the Getty has on their blog right now. Okay. But the exhibit you could put in the chat, it's called casa0101.org, C-A-S-A-0101. And the name of the exhibit is Capturing Beauty and the artwork of John Simmons. Are they showing some of your um, collages too? Yeah, those are some of the, uh, that's that's pretty much only the second time that I've really shown mm -hmm. my collages. Mm -hmm. I had an artist in residence at Los Angeles County in the 80s and um, at this place called the Brockton Gallery. And they're showing my, the LA County Art Museum bought one of my collages. I always forget about that, but this place shows collages. I finished, I made a, a collage that's in that exhibit called Very Fine People on Both Sides. And it's about, uh, has a lot to do with the last four years. And I just finished one last night, which is my last collage about 2020. <laughs> you gotta be careful talking about this stuff in big groups because there's probably people there that might want 2020 to continue in certain ways, but um, you never know. Uh, that's how it is at the studio. You never know who you're working with. You know, it's really funny too, because you'll talk to somebody and they'll be of a completely different nature than you. Yeah. Right? That's true. <clears throat> Best part about 2020 for me is I didn't have to shake hands or hug anybody. That was pretty nice. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. like... it, it became quite inspirational to me. I've made a lot of good art inspired by 2020. Hey, well, stay here. Okay. This is the first public look at this piece. I like to think of my collages as documentaries. Uh-huh. Whoa. Oh, wow. well, that is cool. It's a little cool. It's a little tragic too. Where are the elements? What are the elements? Do you create the elements or are they cut out from things or? Well, a lot of the elements are made up of my photography. Right. A lot of them come from magazines. There's always, there's a lot of stuff in here. There's gold leaf. Yeah. In this top part up here. You probably can't see it very well, but it's real. But sparkly. you can see the, you can see the specularity of it. Yeah. yeah. That I went up to the hardware store and I got the shavings from the guy that makes the keys. 
Uh-huh. There's a sprinkle in the sky, you know. Oh, nice. There's sand in here. Lots of paintings. I wanted it to look a little cinematic with this repetition of yeah. images, you know. I love it. So yeah, that's that's the latest. You guys. You know, it's awesome. You're finding <clears throat> you you know, you're you're creative all the time. You know, when you're when you're not at work, you're in your studio. And I can't tell you, Chris, I feel so lazy, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like right now, I feel like I gotta get something done today. <laughs> Chris, can I make a comment? Of course, of course, please, Linda. John, yeah. I just think it's so fascinating, something that you said about um, that you got the shavings from the keys from the hardware store, because that, that harkens back to your story earlier about the 16th century painters yeah. who had to collect the materials on which they <clears throat> um, you know, uh, painted on and, and they make the paintbrush. So you're doing the same thing. <laughs> I love it. You know, it's it, years ago, I um, interviewed Dion Beebe uh, when he had shot Holy Smoke for Jane Campion. And I asked him, I said, she's such a visual director. How did you know what she wanted? And he said, she had books filled with scraps from magazines or she had dirt in baggies and she would put <laughs> the colors that she wanted on the set. Yeah. And it makes me think of when, and I share with my students, if you're drawn towards something and you have no idea why you're drawn toward it, go for it anyway, because exactly. it will be part of the yeah. filing cabinet with which you open up one day and say, this is exactly why I picked that up. <laughs> At the moment, you may not know, but yeah, eventually right. trust it. You're absolutely right. There, there's this woman, her name is Uzan Palsy. And she made a film called Sugarcane Alley. And she made a film called A Dry White Season with Marlon Brando and Donald Sutherland. Yep. And I shot a picture with her, the one I was telling you about called The Killing Yard. It's got Alan Alda and Morris Chestnut in it. And I don't know who else. In, in fact, I was an actor in that film. I'll say, I'll give you guys, Ernie, you can't go to New York, you're crazy. That was my line, right? But, <laughs> but um, Uzan, who studied under Francis, uh, Francois Truffaut, is a brilliant woman. She's from Martinique and she's not only a genius, but a diva. And she says, I'm with her all day, storyboarding and you know, scouting locations and <clears throat> sitting up all night with her. And she calls me up and says, Johnny, in a very thick French accent, are, are you sleeping? Well, I'm okay. She says, I need you to come back over here. I have an idea for Shango when he first gets out of prison and walks to court. I said, okay, but you have to come here. I said, okay, we're in Montreal. I put on my clothes, I get in the car, I drive over there, I walk in and she says, here's the idea. And she turns on some Beethoven. <laughs> she says, this is Shango walking to prison, but not really. It's gonna be Babatunde and he's gonna play the drums and there's a horn, but it's <laughs> going to be this. I said, okay, I got it. I didn't get nothing, but. <laughs> In the business of saying yes, yeah. brilliant idea. <laughs> <clears throat> and I go back to the hotel. But Linda, you're right. It's like every element, even if we don't use it for this idea, mm -hmm. it becomes, <clears throat> it, it's, it's like, that's the thing about being filmmakers, directors, cinematographers, writers. We're continually downloading life. Yeah. At any point, we can regurgitate it and give it back and make it into something. Where continually, you get into an argument with your friend and you see the light coming in the window and you think to yourself because of your insanity, how wonderful that light is contradicting this argument. Right. <laughs> right, and then you say, the next time I do an argument, 
I hope I can get a good window because I'm gonna put that light through there just like that. I remember having an argument with somebody, I never even used it, right? It was a relationship with a woman. And she was mad at me about something. And the mirror next to the door was cracked. So there were fragmented images of the person in the mirror, right? So I'm looking at this one person and I can't even concentrate on what they're saying because I'm thinking about how cool it is that this cracked mirror feels just like this argument we're having, right? right. I've never used it, but whenever I get an opportunity, believe me, if you see mm -hmm. it somewhere, you yeah, don't know where I got I it. I think it was used in unbearable lightness of being. I think Michael. <laughs> so I think you all said. <laughs> well, no idea is original. You know, uh, you reminded me, Johnny, when I was in China, um, I got a email from a producer saying that they needed me to write something about the way this other movie we we're going to do was going to look for the investors. And I was like, I don't have any time. I'm working 20 hours a day. I have no time to do this. He said, we need something, you know, yesterday. <clears throat> so I was kind of pissed off, but I wrote it. I wrote this thing. Oh, I said, I told him, I said, but I need to talk to the director. We haven't even talked about the script yet. And he said, I asked him about that. And he said, you know what it looks like. I was like, we haven't discussed it. So I wrote something up. And I sent it to them. And I got an email back from the director saying, this is great. I'm going to use this. Now you write something for you. <laughs> oh, my God. What? I, gotta, I have to share something else. Another little bit of valuable information. Yeah. That lady, Roz Bernstein, who owned the company with Cal Bernstein. They were like filthy rich. And she loaned me some money to open up a commercial company. It was called Blackbird Films. We were in business for about three years. We did pretty well making commercials, Mattel, McDonald's, stuff like that. There was some black folks in it. We were doing their commercials and it worked out. And one of the things that Roz told me, cause she'd been in the business forever. They invented the Marlboro Man, her and her husband. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys probably don't even know what the Marlboro Man is, thank God. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she told me one day, she said, Johnny, here's one thing you need to know is when you go to work, the experience has to be a good one for everybody because people may not remember the job, but they will remember the experience. Two things. I got a phone call, it was years ago, and this woman producer calls me up and she says to me, Johnny, are you available? This is so-and-so, do you remember me? I said, I remember you. I saw you in Gelson's one day, a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, right, I live in the neighborhood. She says, I don't remember the job we did together, but I remember that we did a good job and that it was good to be with you. Check this out. Friday, I get a phone call from this producer named Jeremiah Samuelson, Samuels. I did a movie with him called Three Strikes. And it was hard to do it because it had like rappers in it and stuff, right? This guy called me up the other day and said, Johnny, do you remember me? I got your phone number. I, I tracked down your agent and he gave me your phone number. I said, yeah, Jeremiah, I remember you. He says, I got a job. And I was just wondering if you were available to do it. I said, after 20 years, you asked me to do a job? He says, I've been working with a lot of people over the last 20 years. And I was thinking that we had a tough job when we made that movie, but we had a wonderful time. And I said to myself, I think that you should do this job with me because it was good, right? So what you have to remember is we have such an incredible influence on people just because of the things that we are. Mm -hmm. If we can maintain an attitude that moves in the direction of creating a positive, encouraging environment, which isn't always easy to do, but we feel better for doing it. Roz is right. You may not remember the job, but you remember what the people were like. And that's like, that's like a real lesson because I, got, I have this woman working on my crew 
this month that my gaffer program and I was so happy to see her. I don't remember what I did with her. The only thing I remember is her energy and I'm so glad to have her there. You know what I mean? It's just so important to not forget about that. Yeah. Because I'm not taking homeless people off the street. I'm not curing the pandemic. You know, I'm not doing it. You know what I'm doing? I'm making stories. <laughs> Most of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm making people laugh, you know. <clears throat> let, me, let me ask if anybody, any of the students or anybody else here has any questions specifically for Johnny or? Yeah, I'm available. Please. Yeah, Cal, go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming to our class. I really, really appreciate it. I've, uh, I've learned a lot, God, in this past hour. Um, but I'm just, I'm curious. So like at USC, was there anything that you were really glad that you did? And then on the opposite side of it, were there any regrets that you have that you didn't take advantage of or just anything in general, even beyond, you know, film, just that you had at USC? Well, I'll tell you something. And this is, this is a comparison that when I was at SC, it was on the tail end of an industry that was disappearing. You know, I mean, the film business was changing as I was a student there, but there still was the fallout of an institution that had geared, that had geared people for an industry that really didn't exist. But I was really glad that I got that piece of it because they instilled in us a certain kind of professionalism. I don't know if they still do that now, but they prepared us in a very professional way to confront the business. And just like the sound class that I took from a guy named Ken Mura, we had slide rules in that class. Woody Omens, who was a very close friend of mine. We used to study Slavko Vorkovich and we would study the graphics of cinema intensely, right? And all those things, all those tools, all those attitudes towards the profession happened at USC. When I went to teach at UCLA, it was an institution, and this isn't knocking it, but it was an institution that was creating independent filmmakers, which is cool, but it's very different from creating people that are about to deal with the professional world. And I got that from USC. I got, I got that, you know, I got that time was money, money was time you know, professionalism, creating that triangle of creativity, time, and money, mm -hmm. how that worked. You can go fast. How does it go, Chris? You can, you good, want it fast? You good want it fast? fast? Give me a pick two, right? Yeah, pick two. What do we used to say? Good, good fast and good, cheap. Good, fast, and cheap. Pick two. Yeah, what you want, fast or you want cheap, right? <laughs> good, fast, and cheap. That was <clears> right. <throat> right? Um, so, I guess I answered that question, Cal, that I'm, what I missed at USC was the freedom of being an independent filmmaker, but the trade-off was becoming a professional. And I feel like that gift of being given the perspective of a professional has worked out a lot better than if I was given the independence because I find the independence now every time I can. Right. That's yeah, a great question. Great answer. Huh? Oh, I said I can definitely relate to that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As someone who went to UCLA, I, I, I do agree that I, uh, I wish you had told me that before I went there. Yeah, a lot of people do. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. But it's true. We got out of we came out of school and we were floundering. Nobody knew how to how to comport ourselves professionally, and right, we had to figure it out. And a lot of my classmates haven't yeah and still haven't 
Right. Um, but yeah, true. I think that that's a, a real advantage to going to school there. Yeah. Any other comments for John or questions? Yeah, Nick. Uh, wow, I, I sort of just forgot it. Um, That's okay. <laughs> COVID, it's okay. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask you about, I, I, I looked at your Instagram, there's a lot of very like nice black and white photos. Um, and I, I don't know, I just, you know, I was wondering what your thoughts are on like black and white aesthetically and if, if you feel like it's sort of lost. I remember reading that like, you know, the way they used to teach people on black and white was very particular and how to light it. And um, I, I noticed you still shoot a lot of it. You know, I'll tell you, Nicholas, I, all my photographs are black and white. And black and white for me, you're not looking at color. You're looking at the narrative. You know, and I feel like it's it's just all the images cut straight to the narrative. You know, there's you don't get distracted by color. Uh, I love the power of shadow and light for the shadow to force you into the light, or the shadow creates mystery and makes you wonder what's there. It makes you want to know what exists beyond that frame, you know? And for me, black and white does that. It's, there's, there's no gloss around the storytelling. Because what I like to be able to do with my still pictures is I like to be able to take a picture and for that picture to tell a story. And it's kind of corny to say this, but to be able to take a picture, not with your eyes, but with your heart, you know, and that becomes the thing. And my original mentor, Bobby Singstack, who introduced me to photography in a way beyond the camera, used to talk about an image needs to have a ghost in it. It needs to have a soul. It needs to have something in it that gives it the strength to hang on a wall. It gives it the strength to be a message, to be, well, that's the wrong word, but to be able to resonate. And you put a hundred years on a picture and what will that picture do in a hundred years? Will it touch you? Will it move you? It's like listening to a piece of music. I was in the car and I was on 95.5 and they were playing some classical music and I don't remember who the composer was, <clears throat> but the dude said, that's from so-and-so, so-and-two's concerto 1735. Mm -hmm. And I was like, 1735? <laughs> That had some ghost in it. That had some soul. That had something that made it live. You know what I mean? And I want to be able to, I don't even want to be able to because it's actually an intuitive thing, you know, to be able to make an image that sustains and moves people. And those images are so powerful. I have this photograph, it's called Two Shoes. And it's just this little girl's feet with mismatched shoes on. And I have them in a gallery and I walk in there and there's this woman, it's in the business district over by Wilshire, 6th Street. And this lady, she looks like an office lady. You know, she's got her briefcase and all that stuff. And she says, hey, the guy told me you're a photographer. I just bought that photograph. I said, oh, thanks a lot. She says, uh, and her eyes start getting kind of watery. And she reaches in her pocket and has a piece of tissue. And she says, that photograph makes me grateful. She said, I've been very privileged my entire life. And I saw that picture and I'm gonna put it by my front door because when I leave the house in the morning, I'm gonna be grateful and I'm gonna share it with my friends. 
And you think about that and there's so much power to the image. There's, an image is a very powerful thing and it has a life beyond the moment we take a picture, paint a picture, tell a story. It, you know, it's influence is like, you know, it's throwing a rock in a lake and the rings of the rock change the shape of the shore. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing, the power of a picture. So I like to shoot them in black and white. So the story doesn't get confusing. Um, and then I have a follow-up. I remember what I was going to ask. Um, that was such a beautiful moment. Why did you? We, I was going to just end it right there. Now the pressure's on, John. You got to you got to be just as good on the next follow-up. Okay, well, I, this is this is important because Chris has mentioned this, and you <clears> sort of touched on this. Um, I I remember watching an interview with Roger Deakins, and he talked about how his inspiration doesn't always come from other movies. Like he pulls inspiration from photography and painting. Yeah. And Chris has mentioned the same thing. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I totally agree. I totally agree. I'm telling you, that's why we got to look at these pictures. We got to look at, we got to look at the art. I mean, I feel like it's, like I said, it's like sitting down to a meal, you know, it's like, it's a different kind of nutrition and it shapes our vision. I put together a demo reel many years ago. I don't know whether I shared it with Chris or not, but I looked at, I was cutting the reel and I was at this editor's house and he had all these art books. And there was a scene in a film that I shot in a courtroom. And on the cover of the book, it had the coming of Matthew, that painting by Caravaggio mm -hmm. that has that streak of light that's coming in there. Yep. The whole one third of the picture is dark. I looked at this courtroom and it was that image right. completely. I didn't look at that image to make that, I didn't look at that painting to make that image. And then we started looking at other things. I'll share it with you, Chris, so you can share it with people. Um, yeah. I started looking at other things and we began to match my images with different paintings. And I had never done any of those images. I was never said I wanted to look like this, but because I had been eating those paintings for so long. Here's one, here's something interesting. I had to do this promo for Fox and I had to do this thing in New York, Canada and it all had to be on green screen, right? Oh, there it is right there. It had to be on green screen, right? And all the actors had to look the same way and the lighting had to look like they were all in the same room. And I was in I got the job while I was in Paris doing my music videos. And one of the women I know uh, who lived in Paris, she used to teach my kids French, could tell you where the, which tree Napoleon peed behind. She knew so much history, you know, <laughs> art history. She was brilliant. And I went to the Louvre with her and I'm seeing these paintings for the first time in real life. And suddenly I realized that most of the paintings, the light is at 11 o'clock or two o'clock. Mm -hmm. And if you bring the light around, the nose shadow would turn into a valentine in front of their, over their lip. If the light stayed to one side, the cheekbones were accented, the eye sockets were opened, the shadows were in proportion to the features of the face. And I got it. And I looked at Caravaggio. I looked at Vermeer. I looked at all the painters that I dug. And I saw that you could find this relationship in so many paintings that when I got back to the United States to do this Fox promo, which was with every actor on Fox and every actor had to be treated like they were the only person in the world. And you had three minutes with each of them. And you had to act like, you know, they were the most important thing in the world ever. 11 o'clock, two o'clock, save my life. Save my life, right? And I got it from looking at those paintings. So 
Roger's not kidding. I mean, it's like, I'm telling you, man, you don't even have to think about nothing. There's no intellectualization. It's just go look, go look and drink it and eat it. You know, you don't have to like, just like when you listen to a piece of music, you ain't trying to figure that shit out. You know, you're just enjoying it and taking it. That's how you got to do the paintings. And just by osmosis, it's going to reveal itself in the stuff that you do. Yeah. <clears throat> I, that's brilliant. Also, you know, the, uh, the thought is the, the advantage of, of wandering through a museum is you find things that you weren't looking for. If you start Every to look online for, for art, you tend to you tend to search certain categories and it, it's harder to find something randomly, I think, online. But, well, but in, the, you know, the problem, <clears throat> whenever we look at a screen, we have a different relationship to velocity. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're accustomed to absorbing whatever comes across the stream quickly. You know, when you go into a museum, you get to feel something. You know, you get to, you don't take, you don't take your opinions with you. You know, you, you know, you, you get to, to have it for a minute, especially when you look at those, especially now that I shared with you that thing that there's no stores involved, mm. you know? Not only that, but when you get ready to go get that sailcloth and turn it into a canvas, that might be the only thing you did that day. Because you had to walk or ride some kind of horse or something. You know, you didn't like jump in your Lexus or whatever and, ro and roll over there and get it. You know, it was like some effort involved. And all the way there, the only thing you think about was, ooh girl with a pearl earring you know <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna paint that picture one day it might take me a month or i was reading about some painter how he would like mix the chimp mix the oils and the and the minerals to make his colors and he would have to store them in the in the intestines of animals and cover them with oily cloth and hide them in the dark you know and then eventually after he got all his colors together he could paint you know nice. i mean Tell me, did that dude need to pay? You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> or just try writing with a quill pen, right? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it's funny you said you said you remind me, Johnny. It's a little different, but um, you know, several years ago, a submarine, a Russian submarine, I think, went down under the Arctic uh, polar ice cap. Yeah, and when they finally got a another sub to go down there and kind of uh, pull it out years later, um, they found the, the last survivor uh, started writing. He, well, his last dying um, action was to write the story of what happened so that someone would know. He felt that that need to, yeah. to tell his story. And that was that was that he, you know, he knew it was just a matter of time <clears throat> before he, he came, he succumbed to the pressure or whatever. And so he wrote, and I think that that cinematography is the same way. We're telling stories with images and it's something we need to do. And what are we willing to do to make it happen? Um, exactly. And, and while that's all, all of that is true and it's all from the heart, you know, we also have to make a living. So the problem is we will be exploited because people know that we love doing what we're doing. Yes. And they will try to take advantage of us and exploit us. But you should remember always that you are never paid for your time. You're always paid for your experience. Absolutely. And you cannot let yourself be exploited because as much as you want to do it, they need you to do it also, right? So we have to find that balance. And that's so hard. I have been so underpaid on so many jobs because I was so desperate to work. How many times have you not been paid? Because you, you just times. need to get behind a camera. Sometimes I've not been paid even when I was told I was going to be paid. Right, exactly. But you know, <clears throat> and sometimes I've turned work down because it wasn't the right time. I turned something down, you know, because, you know, during the pandemic, because I didn't want to be sick. I didn't have a vaccine. I'm not going to work. And <clears throat> um, and those are hard choices sometimes. But but I think we have to we have to appreciate and value ourselves and, and realize what we're doing. And, and actually, the thing that Johnny's showed us today also is that there's a lot of ways to create. 
we don't have to just go and work for somebody else for an hourly wage. You know, we can we can go out with a camera by ourselves and we can create images. We can make collages. We can go and mix paints. Um, you need to be a bit of a carpenter. You have to make the frames if you're going to start doing that. You know, you can pick but, up um, that iPhone and tell a story. You know, absolutely. or if you if you if your phone's not working, use the camera on the backup camera in your Prius. Either way. <laughs> So. Okay, guys, I need to get up to the studio. Johnny, thank you so much. All right. Johnny, really thanks. thanks. All right. Sure you awesome to I'll see you a little later on. Congratulations right. to everyone. Thanks, John. Hey, John, if you want to share us any, any pictures of what you're doing at the studio, send them along. I'll forward them. Okay. All right. Cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, right. I'll show you that stupid doorway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for taking the time. I know you're busy. Okay, if you can't do it with blue screen, how about green screen? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Take right. care. Thanks, Johnny. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. That was great, Chris. Yeah, he's he's a. Oh my God, he was so much fun just to listen to. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt. I didn't want to, but I figured I if I let him keep going. He'll steer himself back on course. He's great. No, it's just wow. He's he's seen a lot.